Hello and welcome to Macro Minutes. My name is Jason Daw and I'm the head of North America Rate Strategy and your host. During each episode, we'll be joined by RBC Capital Markets experts to provide insights on the latest developments in financial markets and the global economy. Please listen to the end of this recording for important disclosures. Hi, everybody. So welcome to the March uh, 22nd edition of Macro Minutes. Uh, The past two weeks have been characterized by uh, growing inflation worries, an uber hawkish Fed, uh, bond yields at the front end and long end of the curves uh, skyrocketing higher, unabated curve flattening, and fixed income volatility while off the recent peak, still very elevated on a historical basis. Uh, The dollars remain strong, and until the very recent bout of uh, tightening, uh, corporate spreads were displaying um, an unusual tendency by moving uh, wider alongside higher bond yields. Uh, To help us navigate the fixed income and currency landscape today, we have a full slate of um, experts. Uh, Tom's going to uh, tell us if the new Fed dots uh, that are now calling for substantial hikes this year can be realized. Blake will be uh, talking about what the Fed means for the U.S. bond market. Peter will provide uh, insights on whether the hawkish uh, Fed stance applies for the ECB and Bank of England, as well as how the uh, Treasury sell-off feeds into European markets. Uh, Simon's going to delve into uh, GOC uh, net uh, bond issuance ahead of the federal budget and uh, the expected uh, BOC move to quantitative tightening next month. Adam on whether um, after an extended rise in U.S. rate expectations, if it's time uh, for the dollar rally to end. Uh, Robert on his updated uh, RBA call and relative value trade ideas, and uh, Jason Mandel on uh, high-yield credit and whether the uh, spread tightening we've seen recently uh, can uh, continue. Uh, So to begin, I'm going to kick it off with some thoughts about uh, curve flattening and the long end of the curve, which broadly applies to both the Canadian and uh, U.S. uh, markets. Um, So first, uh, we're clearly in a phase uh, for bond yields where upward moves in the front end are transmitted in a nonlinear fashion to the long end of the curve. And this is just a fancy way to say that for every uh, X basis point move up in short rates, uh, that long rates uh, move less and curves flatten. And I think importantly, uh, this is a normal pattern uh, that occurs when central banks are in a tightening mode, and it's really difficult to fight this trend, even if you think the curve is tactically overextended or if the majority of structural flattening um, has already occurred. Uh, For a steepening trend to develop, it'll probably require uh, the policy cycle moving from uh, tightening uh, to rate cuts, which is probably a long way off. And uh, higher inflation, balance sheet reduction, uh, or flows, uh, these are unlikely to push uh, curves steeper, in my opinion. Uh, Second, uh, while the bond market is showing similar directional uh, patterns relative to the past for this point in the cycle, there are some aspects of uh, current market pricing that bears close attention uh, and uh, debate. Uh, various parts of the curve are uh, inverted, uh, so the euro dollar and backs curves at different points, uh, one year and two year uh, forward swap curves, and various uh, forward swap tenors related to uh, policy pricing. Now, inversions, uh, they're very rare occurrences, <clears throat> but, and these even started well before uh, the hiking cycles in Canada or the U.S. kicked off. So without discussing kind of what the drivers are of this or whether it will be more or less predictable recession, the higher conviction takeaway is that um, as long as the market continues to behave in this way, uh, it should reinforce flattening trends in uh, cash bonds and uh, spot starting uh, swaps. Uh, third, I think there's probably a limit on how high uh, long-term yields can go. And I think this is especially the case now considering the significant amount of rate hikes being priced in and on the U.S. side, what the FOMC dots told us last week. So if we assume that central banks can bring inflation down if they want to, which um, you know, I think um, you know, at least I agree with, um, to very tight monetary policy, then this should translate into a situation where uh, the more that gets priced in or delivered, uh, there should be greater stability in inflation expectations and uh, weaker future growth expectations. So this should cap um, how high long-term uh, yields and even real yields can go, unless, of course, uh, growth expectations can turn around or uh, terminal uh, policy rate pricing goes substantially higher from here. Um, So while there's a lot of risks and ifs, if the choice is between kind of following this uh, big move that we've seen um, across various parts of the bond market um, or starting the position for some stability or reversal, uh, the latter seems like a better uh, tactical risk-reward option, in my opinion. And finally, in Canada last week, we we recommended a 5-10 flattener trade. 
that encompasses that encompasses both things that I discussed today, uh, flatter curves and limited upside at the long end. And aside from these reasons, uh, the five-year uh, screen is very rich on the Canada curve. Uh, the Canada curve at this part is uh, steep versus the U.S., and um, the risk-reward profile seems uh, quite favorable uh, overall. Um, so um, the 5 tens curve, uh, minimal negative carry compared to other uh, flattener expressions, and in swaps we target a move to zero basis points. <clears throat> and for a cash expression, we like shorting the uh, September 26s and long uh, the DEES uh, 31s. Um, so with that, now over to Tom to tell us um, about the Fed and their increasingly uh, hawkish language and what it means for uh, policy rates. Good stuff. Thanks, Jason. Uh, you know, I, I would just pick up on a thread that Justin, J Jason left out there on, on the curve. You know, the one thing I, I would say about the curve, particularly as it relates to forecasting recessions, uh, and, and I think this is almost always missed in the conversation, you know, the, 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 curve, the curve inverting in and of itself is not enough to say that there's a recession. There's another ingredient that's almost always necessary for curve inversion to pretend a recession, and that's the Fed being through neutral. Um, and I think given some of the um, uh, hawkish rhetoric that we've heard from, from Powell, uh, that, that certainly seems like a, that, like a possibility, although I, I would hasten to add that, that, that we're not quite there yet. Um, but uh, you know, it's. Uh, I think I've, I've found it interesting uh, over the last um, couple of, of uh, uh, speeches by Powell that you know he he is seemingly you know um, he, he outdoes himself every time on, on the hawkish front. Um, uh, you know, I thought that the, the presser was pretty hawkish, uh, and then uh, yesterday he he comes out and 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 really try to drive home this this hawkish approach. I mean, I I think on some level it, it, it's almost like he wants us to have these extreme conversations, right? I mean, this is what I was writing in the Daily Deck yesterday. It's like he wants us to wonder, hey, is a 75 basis point hike possible? Hey, is an intermediate hike possible? Um, again, it's not that we place high odds on these outcomes. It's just that I think that 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 he's he's completely comfortable with those conversations happening. Um, and one of the things that we highlight. In, in the daily yesterday is, you know, if, if, if he's really very, you know, it could, clearly he's hypersensitive to sort of the inflation dynamic right now. So it sort of begs the question, like, what could get him to sort of, you know, get pushed over the edge to doing something, say, like an intermediate hike? I mean, there, there's going to be plenty, cause, because it would almost always require some trigger, right? Um, uh, the, there's a trigger. Uh, the, the coming CPI report, I mean, it's going to be another firm one. Um, you know, at a minimum, um, the, and, and we don't have a, um, our, our numbers not finalized yet. Still, we still need a, a bunch more data. But <clears throat> sort of our working estimate right now is that the month on month on the headline rises seven tenths of a percent. If that's true, that keeps the, the which is again, let's be clear, seven tenths uh, month on month is is pretty extreme in and of itself. But it keeps the year on year at seven nine, which which is itself uh, pretty extreme. So it's like you know, if if they need evidence um, for some extreme approach, um, uh, that you know they'll they'll have it. But, but I think at a minimum, I, I think you know he's he's really trying to drive home that that 50s. I stress plural 50s are in our future. I mean, I think it seems like certainly to us a foregone conclusion that they're going to do it at the coming meeting. I think it's as, again as we wrote in yesterday's Daily Deck. I think it seems like a foregone conclusion that they do it at the meeting thereafter. Um, so so uh, you know, w which is fine. And and look, we'll, we'll 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 happily forecast that. The thing that we wonder about though is will they actually will these numbers actually be realized? Um, I, and we've, we've said this many times, there are a lot of challenges in the economic backdrop right now, um, you know, whether it's the sort of the plight of the low-end consumer, um, whether it's the sort of the, you know, the, the potential for a negative wealth effect um, for the upper-end consumer. Um, you know, if you're going to layer on top of all of that um, an aggressive Fed, um, I think it's fair to wonder if, if, if these, these forecasts are realized. I mean, look, we, we've obviously taken down our, our uh, growth estimates, have, as we've highlighted uh, uh, recently. Um, and, uh, you know, at this point, it would certainly seem that um, the risk is that uh, you, you continue to take these numbers down. Um, and, and anyone sort of leaning on the Fed um, to sort of, you know, for some sort of, I don't know, hope that, hey, but look, if you look at the SEP, um, you know, they, they have the unemployment rate holding stable over the next two years. You know, that's a laughable forecast, again, as we wrote, uh, the day of the meeting. It's a laughable forecast in the context of the Fed has, the Fed has funds going well through neutral, um, but you have the unemployment rate holding stable over those two years. Uh, you know, no, there's there's no reasonable economic model that would ever spit that uh, out that 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 output. So um, we're, we're, we we would fade that idea and certainly not um, um, uh, take much comfort uh, in in that idea. Um, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Blake uh, or uh, back to Jason. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, fascinating times how quickly central banks are changing their tune. And, uh, Blake, over to you for what this means for the treasury market. 
Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, so just kind of picking up where Tom left off, uh, you know, the rate response to both uh, the Fed and Powell's comments yesterday has been pretty straightforward, um, you know, given how hawkish uh, he was on both counts. Uh, massive front-end led sell-off. Um, this has pushed the curve flatter. We've seen several uh, different sectors of the curve uh, go inverted, which has, has brought a lot of attention. Um, I put out a note yesterday um, kind of discussing curve inversions and um, how – we're hearing from the curve and what it's signaling um, in this cycle may be uh, considerably different from what it's, um, you know, w what it signaled in past cycles and what it's kind of been reflecting about market expectations for uh, economic outcomes and uh, for the path of policy. So um, please check that out. I won't belabor that here, um, but just wanted to mention um, that that note is out there. Um, as far as what we're, um, you know, how, how Fed pricing has moved, how implied Fed pricing has changed since uh, both of those events, uh, we're now pricing in about a 70% chance of a 50, per, uh, 50 basis point hike in May. Uh, we've got about 130% chance of a 50 by June. So, um, you know, whether you want to call that, um, you know, a, a essentially full pricing of a 50 in one of those meetings plus 30% chance of, a, a, of another 50% uh, hike at one of them. Um, clearly, markets have uh, gotten around to this idea that, that there are going to be 50s, uh, perhaps both of the next two meetings. Uh, we're also hiking in an additional 7.6 hikes this year. Uh, that's not including the one we just, uh, we just had in March. So that's also a pretty significant rise in uh, the total hikes for 2022 uh, in line with the move in the dots. Um, kind of interesting that what we've seen there is that, um, you know, market expectations um, at first, uh, uh, following the FOMC meeting, kind of seemed to be taking, uh, you know, the hawkish dot plot and, and the comments from Powell seemed to be taking that as some confirmation of what was being priced in. But, um, you know, since then, we have moved uh, massively uh, in some of the prior sessions and, and gone towards pricing in a lot more, such that there's still a wedge between where markets are priced and where uh, the, the FOMC dots are showing you. Um, to that point, we uh, also took on board the fact that, um, you know, the, the, the dot plot is now showing a terminal rate above neutral uh, and one that is reached as early as 2023. Um, as I said, markets have taken that on board. We're now pricing a terminal between 250 and 275, uh, hitting that by early 2023. Um, and then after that point, it does look like markets are expecting some kind of, uh, uh, you know, corrective cuts uh, back down to a 2% level where it kind of settles in for, um, you know, 24, 25, and 26. Uh, I think going forward, I mean, you know, seven hikes for this year, uh, seven remaining hikes really seems to uh, very likely be established as somewhat of a floor. Um, any hawkish, dovish news, uh, basically pricing in um, back and forth above that level. Also think 50s will continue to be, uh, uh, pricing for 50s will continue to be a feature for the next uh, several meetings. Um, that will be very uh, uh, sticky and, and I think very unlikely to get completely priced out. Um, one interesting thing, inflation markets have not taken uh, a lot of comfort in the hawkish Fed and the shift in Fed pricing. Um, even initially did move down after the FOMC announcement, uh, but since uh, have moved back up with the rise in oil prices uh, to the point where we're basically uh, higher on a break-even basis than we were prior to the meeting. So you know, really not much relief on the inflation side there. Um, you know, looking ahead, I mean, I still think uh, rates will move higher. I still think curves will continue to move flatter from here. Uh, but I think it's going to be very tough at this point to out-flatten the forwards. Uh, we're now showing twos, tens at almost negative 30 basis points by year end. Um, that's a very aggressive level. So even if, you know, I do think that we can continue to flatten on an outright basis from here, uh, outperforming those forwards is going to be very difficult. Uh, I think it's also tough to really get short or put on flatteners here after such sharp moves in both of those directions over the last few days. Uh, leaves very little upside, and I think you're still at some headline risk around uh, Ukraine. You know, any positive headlines, um, and we saw a little bit of this last week with um, some some headlines that were very quickly discounted about uh, uh, you know potential peace talks. Um, but I do think there's some risk there uh, of positivity uh, from that situation leading to some kind of relief rally. Um, also, in this vol environment, um, I think RV and carry trades are very difficult. So. Uh, Basically, even though I, I still think rates move higher, curves continue to grind flatter, um, I'm fairly neutral here and, and would be very wary of, of putting on large positions given how much we've already moved and those risks that are still outstanding, as I discussed. So until we get some clarity on Ukraine-Russia, um, it, it does seem like things are, are more or less fairly priced from here and kind of waiting for, for new signals about, the, uh, about direction. Okay, great. Thanks, Blake. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Peter now on uh, ECB, Bank of England, and the impact of U.S. rates on the European markets. 
All right. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for laying out the groundwork. Well, look, the way um, we are trading over here, I would characterize that as being um, certainly massively influenced by what's happening in the U.S. and particularly in the dollar front end, actually more than you would expect. Now, what do I mean with that? Well, first of all, after many, many years of ultra-low rates, particularly in the euro area, but also in the U.K., we've seen the front end moving quite a lot. And that's arguably um, due to the Bank of England, in case of sterling, already starting hiking before the Fed even, but also of the recent hawkish shift by the ECB when you look at the euro market. Now, the interesting thing, um, if I jump the gun a little bit in terms of market impact, is that one of the hallmarks that you typically see in a bond market sell-off is that the U.S. market underperforms the European market, certainly the euro market, typically also the sterling market. Certainly in nominal space, that has not really happened, and we held our ground um, almost matching the U.S. one-to-one. -one. When you look at the 10-year spread, not in the front end, but in the back end, when you look at the 10-year spread, um, what you see is that the 10-year spread has barely moved, um, neither in euros nor in sterling. Obviously, the shorter end of the curve is slightly different. So what is really going on over here? Now, as I mentioned, and I mentioned this on the call that we had um, the last time round, shortly after the ECB meeting, um, the focus has clearly shifted, certainly for the ECB, from growth to inflation. I mentioned this already, uh, the downward revision to growth from the ECB was relatively mediocre, just 0.5, um, which we think is too low. And they have, despite everything that's going on in Ukraine, they have very clearly shifted the focus towards inflation. We now have a um, soft end date for the asset purchase program, um, and uh, it seems likely that they uh, either hike uh, at the end of this year or, as we think, in very early 23, which in historical context is not too far behind the Fed for the ECB. Now, the situation is slightly different when it comes to the Bank of England. Um, the Bank of England in the last meeting um, has actually turned out to be a little bit more dovish um, than what the market was expecting. We had one member of the MPC voting for no change, despite um, the majority voting for a hike. Um, and they've also changed the language a little bit around what was going to happen in the, in the, in the future meetings. That all being said, in both markets, the market still is expecting a very aggressive path. Um, just to give you some reference, in case of the ECB, we're pricing uh, the peak uh, at around about 1% or just under 1%, and in case of the Bank of England, around about 2%. Both of them should be seen as levels not too far away, at least from the lower end of the corridor that should be considered as neutral. So we're already seeing both of these central banks over the next two years um, hiking into, at the very least, neutral territory. Now, when it comes to us and our expectations, we would probably still see that the market is pricing this as slightly on the aggressive side. But having said that, we would not recommend in the current environment where the Fed is very aggressive, where the pass through into our markets is, um, is larger than is usually the case, going against the grain of the market. We would expect towards the middle of the year our economies to start slowing down. Um, but if that's the case and if that is a catalyst maybe for the market to change the dynamics a bit, that's probably the time to enter any kind of um, trade that would be playing the market more from the long side. But for the time being, we think that's a difficult proposition. So we find ourselves in a slightly difficult spot um, as, as analysts, as strategists, because we do think the market has made a lot of room for pricing already, but clearly sort of the, dy the dynamic in the market is towards higher rates and the path through is relatively strong. I'll probably close just as Blake did with one last bit on inflation and inflation markets because that's clearly a very important part uh, of the market segment. And what you do find is that both in euros and in sterling, inflation markets are pricing um, relatively high um, inflation levels, not only in the near term, but also over the more medium term. And that's certainly most notice noticeable um, in the recent push higher in inflation expectations in the euro market, where previously um, the five-year, five-year forward or the 10-year spot rate should have been considered as low, which has no longer been the case. So the five-year, five-year and the 10-year, they're now sitting at levels that have clearly been in the past levels where the ECB was at the very least comfortable, if not probably already tended um, to the hawkish side. Uh, and that's clearly probably also one of the reasons why um, the central banks are talking like that. Now, over the last couple of days, ironically, inflation expectations in sterling have drifted lower a bit. 
But then again, they're already high to begin with. So I think it's fair to say um, that the inflation impact that we've seen from the central bank has been relatively muted. So despite sort of the hikes in the UK, despite the hawkishness of the ECB, we have not seen a significant re, um, retracement in high break-even levels that we're seeing currently. So most of the move came through in real rates, but not really in break-evens. That's probably something that the central banks will continue to monitor very closely and will probably also look to, um, uh, to address at one point. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Peter. Uh, Simon, over to you on the um, outlook for issuance and um, the Bank of Canada's expected move to uh, QT. Yep. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah, as Jason said, uh, I'll focus for Canada on the issuance side. Um, there are several important upcoming developments. Uh, the first of these should be this Thursday uh, with the quarterly bond schedule uh, for next quarter. Uh, unlike um, most years, but similar to last year, we don't have the, the budget ahead of this, so uh, that usually provides a lot of guidance for what to expect in the upcoming quarter uh, for the first fiscal quarter. Uh, however, we do think the current quarter, uh, where we have $55 billion in gross issuance, should be pretty informative, and we're not expecting uh, a lot of changes uh, across the sectors. Where we think the number of auctions per sector should be the same as the current quarter. Uh, we do think you should watch uh, ultra-longs. There's a risk that these are discontinued, although we are expecting them to stay. And we do think a, a new maturity, so between December 2072 to 75, is likely. And also the five-year sector, where... Uh, we think the March 27s are done being issued and should roll to benchmark, but there is the potential for one more auction. Beyond that, um, the federal budget is upcoming. Uh, we don't have a firm date on it yet. Uh, there has been a Bloomberg report that it's the first week of April, but that's yet to be confirmed, but it should be in the coming weeks nevertheless. Uh, some interesting factors around issuance this time. Um, one is the high maturities, $182 billion. That's because this is the first time pandemic issuance uh, will be uh, maturing, and so they need to refinance. Uh, however, on the other side, there is a very elevated GOC cash balance approaching $100 billion, which we think is too high and can be uh, reduced. Uh, uncertainty around spending initiatives and loan repayments uh, also adds to, to uncertainty overall on the budget number, but we do think that uh, as with next quarter, uh, the current quarter is pretty informative for issuance overall. We think it should be in a 50 to 57 billion range per quarter, so 200 billion plus overall for the upcoming fiscal year. The big difference on the issuance side, uh, and we've seen this already in the bank's move to the reinvestment phase starting in November, is the expected move to QT on April 13th. And so what, what should happen here and what the Governor Macklem has noted is an end to secondary market purchases, uh, currently uh, about uh, four to five billion. And, but they should keep some small auction purchases. Uh, so we are expecting that to remain around 4%, though there is possible that they are uh, eliminated altogether. So the key here and what we've focused on throughout the pandemic is on net issuance and with the bank backing off so aggressively both in the reinvestment phase and expected in, in QT, this means net issuance continues to rise. And, for example, that would move from around $34 billion in Q4 of last year to close to $50 billion in Q2 of this year. And this is especially the case in tens and longs where issuance has been focused during the pandemic. Uh, one final thing to emphasize for the bank, um, given that the BOC has a lot of short-term holdings, so less than five years, uh, passive rundown is, is very much expected rather than active selling and that the bank can very much uh, reduce their balance sheet footprint uh, very effectively just through this passive rundown. And so we do not, we continue to, to not expect them to engage in active sales. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Simon. Um, Adam, over to you on the dollar and, you know, is the first hike um, a sell signal? 
Thanks, Jason. And that really is the critical question for us at the moment. We've been constructive on the dollar for more than a year now. Uh, number one on our thematic trade for 2022 was broadly long dollars. Question is, should we, having had such a severe repricing of rate prospects in the US, should we uh, call the top? And in particular, there is a very widely bought into thesis which does the rounds at the beginning of most Fed rate uh, cycles, that the first rate hike from the Fed marks the peak in the dollar. And the right trade is to sell dollars at the first rate hike and stay short through the rest of the tightening cycle. Question is, should we join that consensus for uh, dollar weakness and uh, call the peak as we pass the first Fed rate hike? And the answer is we don't think we should. So if you look back at the last seven rate hike cycles from the Fed, it is indeed true that on average, the dollar has been lower one month, three months, six months after the first Fed rate hike. But the average uh, hides an extremely diverse range of outcomes. So on a six-month horizon, um, after the first Fed rate hike, the dollar has ranged from, on a DXY basis, everything from up 11% to down 9%. And the reality is um, the average tells us very little, and every hiking cycle is different. And the, the, aver the, the, the observation that really pulls that average down is um, in the immediate wake of the Plaza Accord and the uh, dollar collapse that follows it. So the reality is that, that every hiking cycle is different and um, outcomes depend as much on what's happening in the rest of the world as they do uh, with Fed policy itself and as much on why the Fed is hiking rather than the simple timing of the turning point. So with the forward curve now looking very similar to the dot plot, should we become a bit more balanced maybe? I don't think that's probably fair and a bit more opportunistic in um, expressing a positive dollar view. Should we simply jump from being dollar positive to being dollar negative in the way the consensus is and buy into this thesis of the first hike marks the peak in the dollar, then the history really doesn't support that view. And um, our bias continues to be um, towards a, a moderately stronger dollar, um, th though the way we express that becomes, um, from here, I think, a little bit more opportunistic, having had the bulk of that repricing take place. Uh, back to you, Jason. Okay, great. Thanks, Adam. Um, now over to Robert for insights on the RBA, when they'll tighten, uh, any cross-market and relative value trade ideas. Thanks, Jason. So, as published, we've changed our RBA call as of last week, um, brought forward our timetable for them hiking uh, from August previously to June now. A um, couple of key reasons for that, even quicker erosion of labour market slack than we had been expecting. Our core, and infl core and headline inflation plus wages all starting to lift off a bit more quickly and sharply than we expected. And um, arguably more importantly, Obviously, the Fed and others are not sitting on their hands, and the RBA is ultimately a follower in this interest rate cycle. Um, but against this backdrop, um, broadly speaking, our long-term horizon remains about the same for where rates get to. So our terminal expectations remain reasonably low at around one and a half, one and three quarters for this cycle. Uh, a couple of key reasons there. Um, first of all, still much softer inflationary forces than many other parts of the world, despite things starting to pick up. And then secondly, um, very high household leverage here and a largely variable mortgage market, um, which means that we're very sensitive to uh, cash rate hikes more so than especially the US market, for instance. Um, so in this environment, we've essentially given up on outright longs. It's honestly too hard to hold and things are all headed one way, as Peter mentioned earlier. Uh, instead, though, we like going long the belly of Aussie dollar interest rate curves on a cross-market basis. Um, a 3% terminal rate pricing for us it just looks too high, and especially relative to other parts of the world. Uh, many seem to compare us uh, perhaps a bit too frequently to New Zealand, um, where things really have taken off. We are a very different market. We don't think terminal rate expectations should be as high here. Um, so we like structures like two-year, two-year versus both the US and Canada. Uh, the former, we like entering above 100 basis points, which sounds high, but we've been close pretty recently, um, and the latter at 45 basis points or so. 
Aussie CAS is only about 10 basis points away from entry um, of the US, 40 basis points, but this difference is by design. Aussie CAS is a bit more risk neutral, especially if you know, that's concerned about some um, flight to treasury type dynamics as we see in the Aussie market quite frequently hurting us or even energy complex similarities, especially now given Russia and Ukraine. Um, we did have an Aussie CAD one-year, one-year trade which we put on and took off quite quickly in the last week, which worked well. Uh, so the gist of this is uh, moving our preference up the curve into the belly to more specifically target a terminal rate relativity. Uh, thanks back to you, Jason. Okay, great. Thanks, Robert. Um, now over to uh, Jason Mandel from our credit team to tell us about uh, what's happening in credit markets, how they're managing the higher rate environments, and whether we can get uh, spreads uh, tightening uh, further from here. Sure. Thanks so much. Uh, so in high yield in 2022, we've moved about 200 basis points on yield to wide to 6% now. Spreads are around 370 after touching above 400. Um, a notable move for sure, but still nothing like the March 2020 period when we saw spreads uh, out at 700 to 1,000 plus, and still less than the DEES 2018 swoon when spreads hit uh, 500 at the wides. So that said, we've widened past investment bogeys of many clients, and several have started buying, while some have just backed them up a little bit further. Many clients have expressed uh, more uncertainty and discomfort over the geopolitical situation than Fed rate hikes, which are perceived to be reasonably well telegraphed and thus largely priced in. With wider spreads, a greater share of high yield comes from credit versus interest rates, and investors appear to be most keenly focused on the consumer, on the economic impacts of food and energy price inflation. As for buying, the ability to find size and high yield is critical, and often high yield market drops are accompanied by liquidity declines, and thus reduced ability to find any real size at the wides. Thank you for joining us today here on Macro Minutes. We'd like to thank you for tuning in. I'm Jason Daw, and I look forward to seeing you next time. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives.